Fiber Youth Advocate. I'm Katie, another Fiber Youth Advocate. Yes, and today we're going to be kind of discussing the power of pride and how that plays into having fibro and all that stuff. But before that, we kind of just wanted to take a minute to discuss what this podcast is and what it's going to be about and all that fun stuff. So our podcast is specifically for the fibromyalgia youth community. And so what is it like to have fibro and be young and be a part of several different other communities? What kind of problems do you run into? How do you overcome that? Um, just a space where we could create community for this growing population of young people with living with fibro um, and how exactly do you do that especially if you're in school or if you're trying to get a job or you know dating all that good stuff um, so that's kind of why we're here and what we want to talk about um, that's pretty much the spiel unless Katie do you have anything you want to add um just the fact that um for me that there was nothing like this um, available. I had to find everything by myself and figure it all out myself. So it's just great to have this so that other people don't have to be alone during this. Right. Exactly. Um, I completely agree. Um, I got diagnosed really young too. I was in high school. Um, and there was definitely, I didn't even really know what it was. I had to Google it. So we kind of, since we didn't have those resources, we wanted to be those resources or create those resources. So that's kind of why we're here. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, today we're going to be talking about the power of pride because it's Pride Month. Happy Pride Month, everybody. Um, and we just kind of wanted to definitely touch on the intersectionality between um, being a part of the LGBTQIA plus community and being a young person with fibro and how those all interact. Um, and all that good stuff. So I, my pronouns are she, her. I identify as bisexual. Um, for my family who didn't know that, congrats, now you do. Um, <laughs> congratulations. Um, Katie, do you have anything? <laughs> my pronouns are also she, her, and I identify as a lesbian. Awesome. All right. So first things first, we're going to talk about why we are discussing Pride on our Fibro podcast. Um, and so we just have kind of a couple fun facts before we go into our coming out stories and what that was like for us. So um, Fibro does tend to mainly affect marginalized groups and communities, um, as is stated in um, Musa's dissertation. And with LGBTQIA plus individuals being one of those marginalized community, it's not a shock that a large part of the fibro youth community does happen to be queer. We also want to mention that we're not trying to project any stereotypes here. We're not saying that if you have fibro and you're young, then that automatically makes you queer. Or if you're queer and young, that automatically makes you have fibro. Of course, that's not the case. But there is definitely a large overlapping between those two communities, um, for sure. Because I know, at least for me, a lot of my young friends who have fibro also happen to be either in the community or a strong ally of the community in some way. I don't know if that's the same for you, Katie, or different. But that's um, For me, there's not. I know friends of friends that, but like not directly as well as, as much as you do. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes that's that's interesting. I'm also a music major, though. That's probably important to know. I'm a, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I go to Belmont University and I live in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm currently in Georgia back at home, but um, that's why the room is Tiffany Blue. No, it's not going to be Tiffany Blue forever. It's going to be a dorm soon. Thank God. I don't like this color. I just want to make that so very clear. Everyone's going to be like, I love this color. I don't like this color. I picked it when I was 11, but whatever. Um, but no, yeah, that's interesting, though. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think it's also just because, though, like, most of my friends are queer. And so I think, therefore, by proxy, like, most of my friends that I know that have fibro are also queer. But that's just because I tend to click better with queer people in general. <laughs> like, um, I'm like, so that could just be like, the probability of my personal experience. So according to the Kaiser Family Foundation site, 
LGBTQ plus people experience worse physical health compared to their heterosexual and non-transgender counterparts. Shocker that we wouldn't get better health care. It's a huge shock, I know, for everybody. Um, but there is a big intersectionality between queer and chronic illness cultures and the ways in which one affect another. Um, so in, there was one Canadian study that collected data on people with chronic conditions and 56% of the participants of this Canadian study said that their chronic con conditions affected their queer identities, which is interesting and definitely something that we talked about when we were planning this um, episode, like how does being chronically ill affect your queer identity or vice versa? And how do you see that playing out? Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Katie? Um, I want to say that, like, for me, I came when I was coming out it was around the same time that I got diagnosed. So going to different getting connected with the different communities, I was kind of trying to get connected with two at the same time. And with having fibro, I really could only physically handle connecting with one at a time. So like it was, you had to kind of just figure out which, what you needed more. And like, it, you couldn't become part of both at the same time. Like you had to slowly transition. Right. No, that makes sense. That is, it's definitely a lot because it, both are like great communities, but it is also a lot to like enter two big communities at the same time. So that makes a lot of sense. I feel like I was similar, but I grew up very Catholic in a very Catholic school. So I just outright ignored the fact that I was queer. <laughs> I just pretended it wasn't happening. And so because of that, I just was forced into the fibrosphere first. Because <laughs> that was just the way it happened. Um, but we're definitely going to be touching more on that for sure. Um, we have a whole section on like how those two identities mesh together or maybe how they don't and what we struggled with personally. Um, the last talking point that I have is the queer experience often involves trauma and some mental health challenges, unfortunately, and so does the fibro experience, which is unfortunate, but it does allow these two communities to come together and create a space of healing, which I think is something that's really pretty and really beautiful. Um, it's sad that both of those communities usually involve some kind of heartbreak or a lot of challenges, but I do think it's really beautiful the way those two communities can come together and help each other out. Um, all right, do you want to go first? Because I'm a baby gay and I'll form in my thoughts. <laughs> Hi, uh, so my coming out story is a little, uh, I guess it's kind of normal, but it was a very long process. So I went in and out of the closet a lot in the beginning because I was just afraid to be fully out. So I first came out as bisexual and then people weren't really, no one like believed me. And people just start to think, oh, you know, that's just a face. Because I was real young at the time. I was, like, in ninth grade okay. um, yeah, when, like, I first, like, was like, all right, I'm not straight. Um, and my main reason was I didn't like to lie to, like, my family. So I was just like, all right, I want to go to GSA. And I didn't want to lie about where I would be after school. So I just was like, all right, I'll just say I'm bi. And then little by little, I, you know, you start to realize yourself. And it wasn't until, like... I, it was after high school, like my first year after high school is in beauty school. And my one friend goes, well, like, what do you feel towards girls? And what do you feel towards guys? And I said, well, I would get with a guy, but I would never date or marry a guy. I would only see myself the future with a girl. And that's when like everything clicked with me. And this is just what I felt, but I just said it out loud for the first time. Right. And that was when I was like, all right, yeah, I'm a lesbian. And that's when I started to truly start to be like, all right. And that's really come out and really start to come to my like true self. Nice. Yeah, no, you, sometimes you got to go back in the closet, change your outfit, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, that is very young. Ninth grade, for sure. Um, I feel like that is around the time when people start to at least think it, even if they don't say it. I think that is around the time when people start to actually be like, maybe there is something bigger than what I thought, um, for sure. But my my coming out story is similar but different, if that makes sense. Because mm -hmm. 
I grew up in Georgia, so there's an element of Southern. And I grew up in a, my family, I actually wasn't too worried about coming out to them, but like my immediate family at least. But like I grew up in a very strict Catholic school setting. I'm not going to say the name of the school because I'm not ready to put them on blast yet, but I probably will because it was kind of a real effed up situation. <laughs> so, um, but I went there from age four until 18. So like the entirety of my brain chemistry was formed by this school. And that's really bad because <laughs> this school just is like the classic, like, well, being gay is an illness and it's wrong. And I was like, this is really fun. I really enjoy this. Um, but I didn't really realize I was kind of boy crazy. Um, I like throughout high school, I dated like I had four pretty serious boyfriends, um, which was also a really bad idea. Like, don't do that. But I did. <laughs> like, I don't recommend that, but I did. Um, but like, I remember I was in like ninth or probably 10th grade, actually. And there was this really cute girl who I was starting to become close friends with. And like, I knew I had a crush on her. And I was like, but I'm not like, yay or bye or anything. You know, it's just this one girl because she's real hot. And like, that's like, not how it works. I later learned, but like, you know, that's okay. Because like, I actually would have dated her if she had been single. <laughs> but she's still with the guy that she had started dating when we were becoming friends. So kind of disappointing. But um, for me, but um, that was when I first realized internally, I was like, yeah, I'm probably not straight. But I genuinely like was dealing with so much other stuff that I just did not have the wherewithal to like deal with it. So I just like ignored it. Um, and like, you know, went to my theology class and heard about how being gay and trans was like a sin while listening to exorcisms, real fun stuff at the ripe age of 14, 15, you know, really, really good form formative stuff. Um, and then I um, kind of went throughout high school kind of knowing that I probably wasn't straight, but continuing to date just terrible men anyways, like boys, like these terrible boys who were just so like abusive. <laughs> so I was like, um, so I never came out because I was always dealing with trauma from these really terrible guys. Um, so thanks guys. That was really awesome. Um, and so I, then I went to college and, um, when I went to college, I was still Catholic, kind of Catholic. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't really know, but I was like, definitely still very much so in the closet. Um, I just thought I was like a really good ally. <laughs> <laughs> Um, like my drag name would have been an ally. And so, I, um, and so, um, I, obviously when you go to college, you meet a bunch of different people and I go to a Christian university, but it's very different because it's not pushed upon the students at all. It's just kind of like there if you want it, um, which is a really great approach. Um, so like at Belmont, there are a lot of like queer and gay, um, or trans or non-binary people. And so that was my first experience meeting that amount of LGBTQ plus people in one space. And I just kind of noticed that I started to click with them more. I noticed that I like was just like naturally gravitating towards them, which again, doesn't, I, I was like, that doesn't mean that I'm bi and like, it doesn't but I kind of already knew that I was, so that just kind of added to it. And it wasn't until my last summer, actually, when I was talking to one of my friends on the phone about their experience, because they're bi, about how they felt. Because I do tend to have a preference towards men, unfortunately. And so, like, I have yet to date or be with a woman, unfortunately. I'm a bisexual femme, so if anyone's interested, please, I'm single. I'm so single. Um, but I kind of, I was talking to them about how they felt, because being bisexual, there is, like, some periods of time where I'm like, oh, I kind of am more interested in 
women at this point, but, oh, right now I'm more interested in men and, oh, but like, what if I want to be with the man? Like that does, that means I'm just straight and I'm just like pretending. There was a lot of debating back and forth. And so that's when I finally just asked my friends and they were like, oh, well, you know, this is how I feel. And all this stuff and the way she was describing how she felt is like almost verbatim the way that I felt. And that's when I was like, Oh, okay. So I'm like, not straight. That's really cool. And so I came out to my friends when at the very beginning of the year of our sophomore year. So literally like not even a full year ago. And then I came out to my family, you know, with some family members, it's been like, super easy did my mother ask me if i have a preference yes did i have to tell her that's not how this works a little bit um because she was like but you prefer men right and i was like well sometimes (laughs) but like i mean um she was like well you've had like traumatizing experiences with men so i get it and i was like well it's not like the trauma made me queer and so i we had i had to have a whole talk with her about that and how like I always kind of knew and then the trauma was just like a sideshow (laughs) like just kind of a derailing element um and like with some family members like my mom's mom she's she's out she's gay she was gonna be a nun married two men and then was like actually I'm gay as hell and has now been with her partner Jan for like over 20 years and so is now very pretty vocal about it um she's very cool we love Pat She wants to take me to the Magic Mike show. That's the kind of grandmother she is. (laughs) And she's very gay, too. So I think it's very funny that this is the bonding experience she chooses for us. But okay. Um, But like, so when I told her, she goes, yeah, I know. And I said, you didn't want to tell me. And she was like, no, not really. And I said, thanks, Grandma. Jesus. And then Jan was like, yeah, we've talked about it. You know, you always talk about how much you hate men. So... And I said, God, fine. Um, And then I was not going to tell my abuela, you know, but here we are doing this podcast. So obviously she knows, but like, I, I told her and then she was like, I'm going to erase that from my brain. I wish she had never told me she's from Cuba, very traditional. So I expected that, but I was still like, this is really fun. And then my therapist was like, how did you feel about that? And I was like, not great, Taylor. Okay. Not great. But like, also, what did I think she was going to say like that? And she was like, this is just my, what I was like, this is just because you go to that liberal college. So her theory is that college made me queer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, stay out of school, kids. (laughs) In the words of my abuela. Um, But yeah, that was kind of my experience. And I'm still coming out to some family members. Like some of them don't know. I'm still very much a baby gay. I have yet to have fully come into my queerness I think I'm still a little apprehensive about it just because of the way that I was raised in my school um so if anyone has religious trauma around being queer I got you there too we've covered all the bases you see (laughs) no but yeah that's kind of my long-winded story it's still unwinding I feel like it's kind of the same with fibro as it is with being queer where it's still unwinding that you're still constantly like coming out to people in, oh yeah in honestly like in terms of like my sexuality but also in terms of like my fibro because it is like a hidden disease and so it's yeah. weird to have to say both of those things and have to like kind of come out because I don't want to compare coming out with fibro to coming out with being gay yeah. very very different but like having to tell new people both of those like pretty big factors of your life is like <laughs> like it's a lot for you and it's a lot for them. So that's always like a fun little time. Yeah. It's like, and then also like with not being straight, you're femme. I'm femme too. Right. So it makes it even like harder to right. like, just like be in the world where when I was doing hair, only a select few people knew I wasn't straight because right. the 80 year old lady that I'm cutting ha- her hair, like who knows what her opinions are. And I'm not getting a lesser tip because I just said that I'm gay and you're homophobic. Right, right. I'm like, you know, where, like, something like fibro, people, even if they don't know what it is, it's a condition, so they're more, like... Right. You know. Right, exactly. No, for sure. That's why, like... Because I read one article one time where someone was, like, coming out with, like, my fibro is harder than coming out as gay. Like, I thought it was interesting. 
Um, and I thought it was interesting that he said it like that. And I was like, that's interesting how different it can be for like two different, because I don't even know that I would consider it coming out again. Don't want to. Yeah. To. So. Different. Oh yeah. No, not at all. People, but people all the time, like, I'll just, I kind of will just say it in conversation at this point, because I've had it for so long okay. and a lot of people just know it in my life and I'll be talking to someone new and then and they'll be like, Oh wait, do you have fiber? I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> And then, right. the, you know, like it will, that's just like how, you know, it just comes out naturally in conversation where, you know, I could know someone for many months and then they still don't know because I don't look it and I'm not advertising it 24 seven. I have a rainbow wristband, but that does, but people don't put two and two together. Right. <laughs> right. No, yeah. see, for me, it's become a lot different because now I need a cane because I live in Nashville and it's just like, so it's unwalkable even if you're a healthy person like mm -hmm. let alone if you're walking around campus with fibro and like my legs are a big problem for me now so um like it's interesting because now when people meet me they know something's up but they like you know they're always hesitant to ask what but you always get that one person yeah. who's like what's wrong with you and you're like this is a good introduction <laughs> <laughs> you're like good start dude um yeah especially because i work in the orientation office at belmont like mm -hmm. in the um Oh, what, what is it called? The admissions office. That's where I, uh -huh. so like, I got a lot of parents who are, who ask me about it and like, sometimes they're nice and sometimes they're not. And you're like, this is really fun. Um, and it's kind of the same with like, for me and my experience, like it's similar when I tell parents that I'm a part of our, like, we have a program called Bridges, which is mm -hmm. essentially our gay straight Alliance. We just call it Bridges. Um, but like, when I tell parents I'm a part of that, because sometimes their kids are a part of the LGBTQ plus community and the parents want to make sure the kids are safe going to a Christian school, which is a very valid concern. Yeah. Um, but then there's other parents who are like, I don't, I don't want my son catching the gay. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And they're like, okay, well that's not how it works, Nana, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's always like, interesting for me like telling people both of those things and kind of just letting them do with it what they will for sure I feel like for my family my immediate family it was harder for them to accept that I was chronically ill than it was for them to accept that I was not straight because like with my grandmother being gay and having been gay mm -hmm. since, my parents met when they were like 13 and 15 mm -hmm. so like and my grandmother has been with her partner, Jan, for like 20 something years. So she's been out for a long while now. Um, mm -hmm. I'll never forget when she sat me down. I was like 16 and she goes, I have to tell you something. And I said, OK, are you dying? Because she smoked a lot. And, <laughs> like, and she was like, no, she was like, I'm gay. And I said, I know that you live with Jan. You sleep in the same bed. Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah, we all know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like you you share a mortgage <laughs> like, um but like my parents they kind of grew up around like having a lot of exposure to like gay culture in Atlanta too mm -hmm. so like they really just like to them they always told us like that wasn't a big deal to them I don't think they were expecting necessarily to have a child who was chronically ill and needed a cane so for mm -hmm. my dad especially that was like a harder road for us to cross which is interesting because i feel like for most people that i know it's kind of been the other way if they're chronically ill and queer um, i yeah i could see that because for me like a lot of people that were like family friends or even like family they like didn't really when i first like got fibro not got fibro but you know what i mean you when i first got diagnosed <laughs> and all and like I would then be able to be like oh no I can't do this because I have this where before I was kind of like making excuses why like I knew I physically I couldn't do certain things and be like no I know this makes this worse or whatnot so like I wouldn't do it but like once I actually had something to actually put a concrete thing people were like oh no 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 because everyone in my family they're everyone's in pain everyone has like but we have like structural problems too right so they're like no no you're fine you're fine I remember there was um, a 4th of July, I was on this boat and it was, I was diagnosed a few years earlier and it, it was with family, friends and whatnot. And when the fireworks came and whatnot, there was only like so many like seats you could sit on. And then when like 
everyone like was sitting. I was like, I really need to sit. I need to sit. Right. And there was people there. They were like, you're young. You don't need to sit. You're fine. Yes. And I'm like, no, I have like compared to the person that was sitting said that said that to me, she had nothing wrong with her physically, like for pain wise, like she just is older. Right. That's all she had. And I'm like, no, like literally I'm on more pain meds than you. Like you just take Advil. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, no, like I'm, I'm worse than you. I need that seat. Like get yeah. up. Like, but you know, people just, it took people so many years. It wasn't until I feel like when I got, um, I got more intensive MRIs a few years ago and, and then I got my handicap pass about a year ago. And I feel like that really like made people, people understood, were starting to understand. It took, I was, I was really young when I got diagnosed, you know, people are, start, it's been like over 10 years. So like in the beginning, people were very like, eh, I don't know. And then as I got older and really stood for what I can do, what I can't do, yeah. and then start to get more, you know, help. Um, then people were like, all right, you know, I guess yeah. it's real. Like, it's like, oh yeah, only living for 20 years of living with this. Now it's real. You know, right. it's not like I've been suffering for 20 years Right. where being, knowing your preference people, you know, it's, it's, it's just what it is. Right. No, for sure. I've definitely experienced that. Um, especially with like family, friends and stuff like I totally get that. Cause it's tough. Um, because they are in your family circle, but it's also tough because it feels like sometimes they don't understand as much, but they're still so close and you still love them. Um, but I've definitely experienced that where people are like, well, oh, you're young. And I'm like, yeah, I know. That's what makes this even worse. Yeah. yeah. Live with this the rest of my life. Like, right. If I got when I was 50, at least I had 50 good years. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> no, literally. And I'll read a bunch of articles where they'll be like, signs you've had fibro since childhood. And I read them and I'm like, why did I read that? I'm sad now because I've had it for so, like, really my whole life, yeah. for as far back as I can remember. And like, oh, yeah. my mother definitely has it. Her doctor just referred her to a rheumatologist because she's not yet diagnosed. And she was like, can I be a guest on the podcast? I was like, when you go get your damn diagnosis, woman. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like, then we can talk about the genetic. Cause yeah. Every time, like, I talk to her about a symptom, she's like, oh, I have that, too. I'm not, and they don't know if it's genetic yet. But there are mm -hmm. studies that prove that if your parent has it, your child is eight times more likely to have five, yeah. which is a huge amount. And so I was like, have you ever considered that since I have it, there's a good chance you have it, mom? <laughs> we yeah. talk about that a lot. But um, so with her, it's like it was pretty easy because she understood it. But like, yeah, definitely, especially with like my Cuban family, because like it's just I mean, mental health is not a thing. Like, what's that? physical health is yeah are you dying well then you're fine your cuban blood will boil it away <laughs> yep and it's like it's not really how it works unfortunately wish it did but it doesn't and my dad is like so healthy like he's just like and he, it's not because he like eats well or exercises like no he drinks often like we're, we're catholic cubans but mm -hmm. like um he just like is very fortunate like he has good health and so it's harder for him to get it because he's got so much energy and is just able to do everything. And so it, I think really for me, when I got the handicap pass was a big one. For some reason, people are like, oh, well, when you have the handicap pass, it becomes real. And you're, yeah. and you're like, I'm so glad that's the defining point is paying the amount of money to get like the notarized. <laughs> I know. Um, from my, from your doctor or whoever, and then taking it to the damn I only got it once I got, once I uh, went to college because the walking on campus. Yeah. And I was like, and that was the, that was the only thing that forced me to get it. Otherwise I was like, you know what? I don't need the handicap parking. Right. No, same. That's why I got one was because of the parking. I was like, I yeah. need to drive because I'm not walking on Belmont. You feel like you're always walking uphill no matter where you are. And I don't know you do and so I was like I was like I actually can't walk this I live on the opposite side of campus from the music school because that's where all the upperclassmen housing is that's awesome um like it's nowhere near where I need to be ever yeah um and so um that was why I got it too is because like I'm not gonna get ticketed yeah. like 
which is insane. That's a different issue. Why do we ticket students for parking on their own campus? Whatever. <laughs> it's insane. Um, but yeah, no, that was the same reason. So for some reason, the handicap pass and the cane made it real. The cane was a big point of debate between my family and I. And then I was like, this isn't a debatable issue. This is, I was like, well, this is a mobility aid. This isn't, and I didn't tell my dad for the first four weeks because he was living in Georgia mm -hmm. and I was in Nashville. And I got it the first semester of my freshman year because I was like, I actually can't do this anymore. I need the cane. Um, yeah. And now it's become like my identifying factor. And a lot of people think that that's sad and like it could be, but I don't really care. <laughs> because I, I I need it so it's like yeah. and I also like like it like there are pretty canes you don't have to get you know the, the medicinal looking <laughs> like they make nice old lady canes right like <laughs> like one of mine has like flowers like you don't ha it doesn't have to look bad yeah. but um there are ways to like gen z it up <laughs> like, um but like especially like adults when I because, like, my Instagram handle is girl with the cane. Go follow it if you want. <laughs> like, adults be like, that's so sad. I'm like, not really, though, because this is a brand that, as a singer-songwriter, I like and I want to put out there. Because when I was growing up, there was nobody who was, there was no major singer who was very vocal about their chronic pain or about a disability if they had one or anything like that there was not a super huge singer like on the grammys that was like using a mobility yeah. aid and like i just kind of always wonder what if there had been like would i have been more willing to accept that i this is something i need it's not like it's not like a fashion statement it's like <laughs> it's like something it's like something i actually that improves the quality of my life and i therefore need like yeah. So that was kind of why I chose to do that. But yeah, definitely. Um, that was a huge point of debate with my family. My dad called me a pimp for the first solid five months. I had the case. <laughs> And like, then we got over that because like his way of coping is just really terrible jokes. Like really bad. <laughs> but you know, he's there now. He's he's gotten there. Um, took a couple years. I'm 20 now. I got diagnosed at 17, but started talking to him about it at like 16. So he's had four years now, so we're getting, um, but yeah, so adding the queerness to all that was just kind of like a plus for everyone. Yeah. There you go. Let me throw something else at Yeah. So speaking of fibro and being queer, um, we're going to kind of now jump into like how our fibro, like affects our queer identities or how our queer identity affects our fiber identity and like how do you stay tapped into both of those communities or try to um do you want to go first Kate? sure um so i feel like in the beginning being part of both was very hard on me mentally youth constantly you know ha no all right i have this condition and then also just the normal struggles of realizing that you're in the queer community and that, you know, you're not straight. You're not, you're not like what typical, what everyone wants to say is normal, you know, you're not saying that it is normal, but you know, you're not, you're not the norm. And, you know, it, it puts a lot of different struggles and problems, just mental battles uh, right and then just trying to stay in between both you know um for the queer community i used to i came out when i was you know when i was so young um but i used to go to it was like an hour away it was this um, lgbt center in um out east on long island and on Friday nights, it was like from eight to midnight. It was like for, you had to be like under 21 to go. And it was just a place that we all got together and you just were able to talk to others and communicate. And they would have like different like themes and like parties and whatnot. And it was like a $5 to get in. And it was just, and it was basically just paid for like whatever food they gave us or whatever, you know? And, um, and it was great. But then as my fibro got worse, 
getting myself to, I started to like not want to go because it was just, it was an hour away back and forth. It got home at 1 a.m. And then the next day I'd sleep the whole entire day because that's how much it took out of my fibro. It's like after an event, I sleep the whole entire next day. Right. So, and being a teenager, that's not really something you want to be doing. I, it made me feel like I was lazy, like just all different kinds of things that, and, but you still, but you also know that being part of each community is so beneficial to you and to your health and just to your mental well being and knowing that you're not weird, you're not crazy, you're not alone. You, you know, you have people, you have a community, people are going through the same exact thing and people, you know, these people like help you in a way that no one else in my life really could because no one understood in the level that I needed. Right. So getting yourself to each space was just, it was, a, it was having fibro made it a much harder struggle than it had to be with coming out. Right. No, for sure. That makes a lot of sense. I feel like a lot of people relate to that too because that is one of the at least from what I've read and heard from other people with fibro that is one of the biggest struggles I mean of course the physical pain sucks um and the fatigue sucks like all of it sucks none of it we don't want any of it right like none of it's good let me make that so <laughs> none of it's good but like the hardest part is like the mental toll it takes on you of having to miss things or have to sleep all day because you chose to go to something and then feeling like it's your fault because you chose to go to that event um and like I feel like from what I've heard and like from my own experiences that's almost harder than the actual symptoms itself so oh, yeah. that mental battle um so because for me it's very similar where it's like even at college they have a lot of like LGBTQ plus spaces and student orgs and groups that like I would love to be a part of all of them and I'm like an overachiever um so like I would love to be in charge of all of them like I'm the vice president of our disabled student union and that's not even a queer space um but it's a good space for me because for me personally I consider fibro a disability not every oh. but I do especially because I have a cane for me but if you don't to each their own you're not wrong or you know you're not wrong um yeah. but like even that's a lot for me like being in charge of anything or like even just going to any of those events um is a lot for me um but it yeah. also like you said katie like so you've you know it's so vital to like your mental health and well-being and to also still be able to stay like plugged into both of those groups that are like equally important to you. Um, and I think that I, that's something I still struggle with for sure, especially because I'm newer to the queer space. I'm pretty good about staying tapped into the fibro space. I mean, I'm a fibro youth advocate, so take what that point to well. <laughs> Like, this is kind of like- I hope we're connected. Right, like, <laughs> right, just a little bit. So like, this is like my life, like disability advocacy is like some one of the, main things I do with my life my current job is centered around it my a lot of my music is centered around it my social media um so for me it's for me personally it's always been harder like how do I tap into the queer community um and and then especially being a you know a baby gay it's hard to like do I fully belong like in this space um yeah am I like fully allowed to be in this space um and how do I stay tapped into that and I think the best way to do it is like just <laughs> honestly sorry that is my dog Ella <laughs> it's Ella and Bella over here she's my little uh, chronic pain buddy she's got arthritis <laughs> um my the best way to do it is like to kind of just figure out what works for you um, yeah. for sure if you have anything you want to add Katie while well, I'm es <laughs> escort her out of the room <laughs> no, uh, so definitely everything that you said, you know, you just got to figure out what is good for you. And as long as you know what's right for you and you do it, then you're doing what's the best thing for you. And that's all that matters. Right. For sure. No, I completely agree. Um, and I feel like that's a balance that no matter who you are, nobody can ever fully get there because it's so hard. 
I mean, I think you can, but it's just one of those things where like, even just balancing your anybody's life in general is such like a task that's like so hard to do, whether you're chronically ill or not. And adding a chronic illness into the mix just adds a whole nother layer of confusion. Yeah. Um, and so if you if you feel like your life is spiraling out of control, if it helps, everyone feels that way. So you're like, you're like not alone. Um, especially I feel like if you're trying to deal with a chronic illness, but you still want to be involved in like queer spaces and like queer communities, like you're not alone to feel lonely in that journey. You're not, but if you feel that way, that's very valid. I felt that way for a long time. I still do sometimes. Um, like in Nashville, the big thing is to go to play. There's a play in Nashville, a place like a club called play. And then there's a mm -hmm. one in Kentucky and it's a huge deal where like in the front, they have like a drag show like every night. And it's like, they'll have people from RuPaul's Drag Race come in. So it's like top quality drag um, and it's super fun. And then you go into the back and there's a dance room um, and like a bar and all that fun stuff. And mm -hmm. so that's always a place that I really enjoyed going to. And I'm not, especially because of the fibro, like partying isn't like a big scene for me. And I don't like do it often, but like it's an 18 plus LGBTQ club. It was the first like queer space I entered where I was like, oh, I actually like this, which was weird for me because I don't like partying. But like I think it was because it was like queer. I felt a little more like I belonged. Um, yeah. And especially being a woman, like you still have to be careful when you go out. But it's you can because it's a queer space, you just feel a little more safe. Um, yeah. So that also helped me for sure being like a fresh 18 year old. Um, new to college and that being my first like real party ex like experience um but like now I know like if I want to go do that like I definitely have to plan to like because I know if I go to play that like that night I'm going to be out of commission for at least the next day minimum yeah. um b because it's fun but it is a lot it's dancing and it's walking and it's standing and there's not really any places to sit um, cause it's like, it's a club. <laughs> yeah. Um, so like, that's kind of my other advice is to also, even if it's just like, it doesn't, and it definitely does not have to be partying. There's so many queer spaces beyond that, but like, even if it's just going to a meeting and you know that that'll take you out or like going to a support group, like my yeah. advice is just to your, to the best of your ability, kind of look at your schedule and plan. And if that's maybe like, you're like, oh, but I have to go to this thing tomorrow, then like weigh your options and it's not a bad it's not a bad thing to say no i have yeah. a hard time saying no I'm a 20 year old in college i'm not supposed to say no theoretically yeah um but i've learned and that's kind of something i preach a lot of my peers now where i'm like you know it's okay to say anything if you do anything you will burn yourself out i burned myself oh, yeah. cool. I was super fast yeah. you can burn yourself out like crazy fast yes. And especially already having like chronic fatigue, like or fatigue fibro and fibro fog, like you're it's already like working with three spoons versus, you know, the whole world yeah. that other healthy younger people might have. And I think especially being younger, it sucks to see other people it's like you're happy for them, but it's hard to see other people just be able to go, 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 go. And yeah. Um and you're like, I'm young, I should be able to do that, but I can't. Yeah. It's like people will be working more classes that doing more classes than me, working more hours than me and like, you know, be able to like have no problem and then still go out, still do this, still do that. And I'm just like, no, like, and I'm be like, well, why do you like, I take 12 credits and then I won't take more than that. Cause I know the stress would be too much. Be like, why can't you just like add a fifth class? Cause then it's free the fifth class. And like, I mean, no, I, that will burn me out like crazy. And then I'll fail all my classes versus getting good grades in all my classes. Right. And my, my whole, my whole everything I'll sp I won't be doing any of my work and I'll just be spending it all in bed because I'm so exhausted. Right. It's like, but you have to realize that you do have these limitations and you have to know where your limit stands and is because if otherwise, you know, you're not any use to anyone with it, with you just not not you know basically burning yourself out and not 
and making yourself not even an option. No, sure. that was definitely something I struggled where like there was one semester where I just took on way too many classes and especially like being a music major at Belmont. I love Belmont. We have a phenomenal program, a great music business program. I know a lot of people know that, but like it is like college for me was like truly a lifesaver in general. Like I needed to get it. I love my family, but I needed to leave. <laughs> I needed to leave specifically my high school. Like I was like, when I graduated, everyone else was crying and I was like, see you suckers. I was like, I don't miss any. Bye bye. I was like, I no. <laughs> like goodbye. Um, so I needed to like, I knew I was going to go out of state. Like I worked super hard, like got a scholarship. Like I did, I did everything right. I was the good Catholic girl, straight A students. Everyone at the school knew me. Another reason I didn't come out because everyone and their mother quite literally knew me. My dad was on the board. My mom worked as the receptionist at my high school. My my grade was only 20 kids. That was my entire class. So everyone knew me for better or worse. So I didn't need them being in my business. Yeah. But like that was college was definitely like a lifesaver for me but there was one semester where like I love the music program but you're taking so many like zero one credit classes but it's like if you don't take them you don't get your degree like you have to yeah. take them. like I can't not take my music seminar I'm a music major but that's your yeah. credit course because it's only 50 minutes a week but everyone performs mm -hmm. 50 minutes and you uh, yeah. so it's like stuff like that where like there was one semester where I'm also in the honors college and I added on an extra honors class and I mm -hmm. quickly had to withdraw because I was like, I'm actually going to fail. And it's not even because of the assignments. It's because of my attendance. Like, and I had yeah. like a disability office services letter saying like, because of my fibro, I'm not able to attend, but I was still like, no, I actually can't attend any of these. Like this 8am is like a student yeah. for me. Like, yeah. and sometimes it's unavoidable, but like, that semester, I was like, I'm gonna have to let go and let God. I'm not Catholic anymore. But I feel like I need to make that so clear. I'm like, I'm so far removed. Um, but um, yeah, so that's it. That's definitely tough, especially in school or work is like, knowing your limit and like your hours. Um, so I think that's definitely a big part of it, too, is just, like, learning what you are and aren't capable of. And if you don't know yet, that's okay. Like, honestly, neither do I. They gave me a podcast when I know nothing, and they <laughs> really did that. But she did. And so, like, she, I got the job, and then she immediately said, oh, yeah, I'm in charge of a podcast. And I said, that makes sense, because I can't shut up, but also I know nothing. <laughs> You don't need to know anything. It's that's okay. That's true. That's true. Um, I know that I'm I'm funny, and that's kind of it. <laughs> um, that's all we need. Um, but no, yeah. So that's definitely. I think for me, that's been like the best way, and also just like even just like talking to friends or just going over and having a chill night. Because again, like for me at least, like a lot of my friends are not straight or they are in a part of the community and if they're not there are really good allies so it's like mm -hmm. even that for me I consider to be like a part of the queer community because we are oh, part yeah. of the queer community so like even just like having like a chill movie night because a lot of us in that group like even even though a majority of them don't have like physical disabilities like th maybe they have ADHD or they have anxiety or they get overwhelmed very easily and so like all of us just might need like a chill watch random youtube videos night and that's like a nice chill way to like still stay tapped into the community so like it doesn't always have to be like you know going out or like going to a party or this oh yeah for sure i think is important to know yeah i remember one time a whole entire group of my friends we all um we just went we had we made our it was just a group of us, but like we made like we, we said it was like a queer pool party, but because everyone there was part of the community right. in some way or form. And it was just all just hanging out, hanging out and being in the pool, you know, nothing crazy. Right. But like it was like exactly like that. You know, you just you had your community and you had them right there. And then I just left with like the biggest smile on my face because I spent all day with them. Right. And that's what we need sometimes. Exactly. 
no, for sure. I do. I do that often where <laughs> I'll call. Well, you have a much larger pool season. <laughs> I, do. I do have a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, we it's we're, the pool's about to open for sure. It's so hot down here. That's so unrelated. It's related. It's because I sweat so much already. I like I can't control my body temperature as is. And then for Georgia to add this ninety degree heat in June, July, I'm gonna be so pissed. I already know it. I'm gonna be walking. In. I work at the Department of Public Health as an intern. I'm gonna be walking in. I'm gonna be sweating my cojones off. <laughs> I'm gonna have to go call people about how their kids are deaf. It's not. It's horrible. <laughs> like, I love it. I love disability advocacy, but it's miserable because it's simply so hot here. It's like, it's like everything in the summer. If you're not in the pool, it sucks. So, like, God, like, that's another thing. Temperature control. Can't have. Can't. Yeah. Like, our AC breaks often because it works itself over time because it's so hot that it, the AC unit freezes over. So, like, we're just like, yeah, we're just the people where we have like fans in every room of our house. And yeah. so that's just kind of like how it is. Like I go away to college and I forget how tropical looking my house is and we didn't purposefully do it. It just happened because, because of my dad and then my, and like my mom is like was raised kind of by my abuela so, since she was 13. So like she's from Pennsylvania, but she's very culturally Cuban. For sure. She's the most Cuban green guy I've ever met in my life. <laughs> um, but yeah, God, it's so hot. But yeah, we do we we do that. I will say not as often in Nashville just because this it does actually snow there a decent amount. Um, but we definitely will just do that where we just like get together and just hang out or chill. Yeah. Um, or like one of my best friends, Jillian, I'll call her and I'll be like, hey. Um, like one time my roommate kicked me out because her boyfriend was coming into town and she kicked us out. Take with that what she will, but she kicked us out. And I said, that's fair. You know, like, uh, that's fine. And so I called Jillian and I said, you want to have a queer night? <laughs> where we, where I go over to your house and I bring the things that I bake once a week because I'm, you know, kind of chair ridden. <laughs> um, you know, I crochet because I'm 80 and we talk about all these different things, <laughs> which isn't like specifically queer, but I don't, I just called it a queer night. And so, so we do that often, but um, yeah, definitely just stuff like that has helped me a lot for sure too. We kind of wanted to mention a website that when I was researching, I discovered it's called the Cranky Queer. And um, it's a really great website where it's like almost like the perfect intersectionality of um, what it means to be queer and chronically ill. Um, and a bunch of people will write, write in about their stories or their experiences, or even if it's just like a joke or like they want to share an achievement. Um, and you can go there and read through other people's experiences. And I'm pretty sure that the author or the um, creator of the blog, I can't remember what their name is, um, but they will blog about different topics relating to being chronically ill and being queer. Um, and that's a great space to tap in if you're um, having a day where you're just, you you can't really get up out of your bed or off the couch that much and you're flaring and you, um, but you still want to feel a little less alone, a little more tapped into your communities. Um, whether you just want to like go and read people's stories to feel less alone or you're implied, you're, um, implied jesus i can't speak <laughs> you um feel like you want to share your own story um so it's called the cranky queer it's crankyqueer.org um and it's a great blog i've read it and i definitely like it a lot so i think you should check it out um that's kind of our takeaway challenge for this month at least um katie did you have anything you wanted to add before we episode um i also just wanted to say that you now since everything since everything with covid that's ever happened happened and whatnot that also with fibro if you want to get more into the queer space there's also like online things um like online meetings and stuff like that through like local whatever your local lgbt center is 
they will have like they also have they don't just have in person they'll also have things like on zoom and stuff so it's always good to check that out if you need more support for sure yeah that was the good thing about covid is we realized a lot of things could really be just goddamn emails <laughs> like all those stupid meetings people would call and then you're like this could really just be a zoom meeting you know <laughs> yeah that's not that they're stupid but like at work they're stupid i i stand by yeah. that um but no, for sure. That's a very good point is that um, COVID was like terrible, especially for Connor. But that was the one thing it brought was like a lot of good online groups and communities that are s- still alive and still meet online today for sure. Um, so that's definitely um, a plus and definitely something worth checking out. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the end of our first episode of The Power of Pride. Um, again, I'm Bella. Um, I'm a fiber youth advocate. And I'm Katie, another fiber youth advocate. With that, um, I hope you guys have a good day and a good rest of your month, and we'll see you in July.